I guess I'll just say like, I know that I think most of us here have already presented or will be presenting today, um, but I'll say it anyway. We would love, right? we're still looking for a couple more people to sign up for some final chapters um, that are less, um, less uh, R heavy. Um, still, I mean, still related to data science, but it's more of, uh, you know, how to get others involved and building the community and, and things like that. Um, and a reminder that one of the other co-authors, Josh Rosenberg, is uh, going to be a guest, discussant or, or host or whatever, um, on one of the chapters as well. Um, and that's been updated in the readme file. So if you do have uh, any other desire to lead out a non or heavy discussion, um, there's a couple chapters left for you to discuss. So. Ready to go? Yeah. Yep. All right, everyone, see my screen? Yep. Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Let me try to. Okay. All right. So we've got chapter 13, walk through seven. And uh, my name is Mike. I guess a little bit about me. I uh, work as an academic advisor at a, at a university. I actually don't have a full-time data role. I've used uh, R in a master's in analytics program. And I kind of first started reading the data science and education book along with uh, actually the tidy models book last fall when I was looking for a, a class project and I kind of used the the random forest uh, which is next week's one um, kind of as inspiration for for an assignment and I have I have worked with other tools and, and, and other kind of higher education data um, so but when I saw multi-level models I kind of was like like what is that? <laughs> you know, like you know, it's like text mining. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I'll, and I'm like, well, it's like, well, I don't really know what that is. So um, these are a couple quotes from the book. It says, you know, how can we include variables like cases and student grouping levels, like classes or schools, in our model? And multi-level models estimate the effect of being a student in a particular group. So. Um, and just kind of as a, like a preview of where we're going, obviously you know this if you've looked at the chapter, but ultimately there's gonna be kind of linear regression um, and a linear regression where we're, look, we're looking at uh, courses and groups and, and those, those effects. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, does the amount of time, so here's the questions, are these, these are also from the book. So does the amount of time students spend on a course depend on the specific course they're in. Remember from um, is it uh, the, the first walkthrough that there was a linear regression where the dependent variable was final grade and one of the independent variables was the amount of time that these students uh, in the online science classes spent in the course room. Um, so, so how do courses factor in there? Um, does the amount of time students spend on a course, oh, is that the same thing twice? Or no, does the amount of time students spend on a course affect the points that they earn? Um, and so I was kind of thinking of some examples of like, you know, you could have different courses. There could be a course that changes and you might have a course that's redesigned or goes to online, you know, with a lot of courses going online recently and you might be looking at some historical data, um, retention, or, or success in particular courses. And then um, you might be kind of be wondering like, well, how do you sort of adjust for the different courses within there? Um, and so that's kind of how I first thought of, okay, that makes sense. That's sort of an interesting use case. Um, and then as we'll see, once we get to the end of the presentation, one of the big things, um, that multi-level models sort of seeks to solve is related to the uh, independence, uh, the uh, requirement for linear regression to have independent observations. 
Um, but anyways, um, so I'm curious if any, anyone has experience using multi-level models, um, you know, or, or can you think of sort of other examples or use cases sort of based on what you've read or what we've, I just talked about? Or yeah, have you used this or how might you use this in an educational setting? I mean, my, I, it's been a while since I've had to use it. I'm doing some other more exploratory stuff um, on the current projects, but we've typically done, you know, students within a school. And so we'll, you know, there, if there, is there a school effect along with, you know, the other linear effects um, or is the linear effect different based on different schools um, or, you know, districts? Um, <clears throat> But one thing that I've, you know, I, I'm uh, uh, developmental psychology trained. And so like we, we used multi-level models for um, people nested in time. <clears throat> and so we just assumed that, you know, with, with multi-level models or hierarchical models or whatever, um, <clears throat> we were able to try and get um, intra-individual change over time. Um, at, a, 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 potentially a little bit more accurately, depending on how many time points you have. So that's that's how I've used it before is with longitudinal work of individuals or kind of the nested nature of some of the work that I do with schools. Yeah, some of the examples were like, if you had uh, individuals taking some sort of survey or assessment multiple times, then that, potentially violates the idea of independent observations because obviously you're not independent from yourself two days later. And so like it's sort of, you sort of cluster them together or look at both the, the multi-level aspect is like looking at as an individual, but then also taking into account like the group. So like within and between groups. And yeah, the schools, there's, you know, courses, there's like sections within courses, there's a lot of different potential groupings. Any, any other examples? So, oh, oops. Um, I, I have a question. Okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> when, when would, you, when, Maybe this, maybe I'm, I'm recall, trying to recall the chapter, you know, but when, when would we decide to use like, oh, I should probably use a multi-level model here um, rather than a, <clears throat> you know, dummy variables or moderate, you know, some sort of interaction rather than a multi-level model. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the book I'm going to make the point that like, by classes, it just makes sense, seems to make sense. Um, and you know, for, if you're looking at classes, cause of the, you know, you could have um, students in a particular course. I mean, you know, there could be a difference between, it might be the same instructor from one semester to the next, but the instructor did something different the second time, or, you know, the students in the class they kind of had a study group. And so that one course was different than the other ones. The, the book seem, seems to, to say that there, those are use cases and, and maybe you could sort of infer, you know, schools would also be the case. So just if that's, um, if that's probably, I think there's ways to test that statistically. Um, it might go beyond my present knowledge of like sort of running the models and then looking at the summary statistics and then based on that saying, oh, well, you know, I think, I think we'll get to a little bit of that where um, once we get to the actual LMER um, model, it, it kind of shows what are like the group differences. So maybe, you know, you could, maybe you could run something like that just to see whether there seems to be group effects happening or not. And if there's not, maybe then you could do something else, but I, I don't know if anyone else has Anything to add to that? So, so yeah, I'm not not 100% sure 
Um, but I guess, you know, other than statistical ways of looking at it, certainly, certainly when you, when you know that the grouping, when anytime you have like groups that would threaten the idea of the independence of the observations, I guess would be a way to look at it kind of more theoretically. So um, we'll look at uh, dummy coding, you know, obviously the multi-level models. Uh, there's a few, few, few different models related or uh, packages uh, related to just the, the different um, models we're doing here. And then also fast dummies was a tidyverse dummy version that I found online. So I used that one as well. Um, so dummy variables. So I've got two definitions here. The first one, dummy variables are artificial numerical variables that capture some aspect of one or more of the category variables. That's from, um, that's from the book Feature Engineering, which has a section on dummy variables. And that's available online for free. So I thought the artificial numerical variables, I thought that kind of resonated with me. And then the second one's from, from the book and it says dummy coding means transforming a variable with multiple categories into new variables where each variable indicates the presence and absence of each category. And so basically looking at, you know, a lot of models will require, not all, but a lot of models will require the independent variables to be numeric. And so if you have qualitative variables, they'll need to be transformed. And a lot of times you don't have to, to worry about that because like the uh, linear regression function will do that automatically. Um, so the the chapter in this section about dummy variables, a little bit is just kind of sort of show what's um, going on behind the scenes. I don't know if anyone's ever had to like make dummy variables for anything else, but if so, uh, speak up. Um, so the, the book goes over the iris data set, which is three species of irises. And uh, then you get this code here. So for the, the dummies package kind of works better with base R. So it, it kind of had you convert Tibble into base R and then do this get dummy um, to this iris data set. That's the D underscores is the base R version. Um, uh, so that's the code there. And then you can see that for the, the first, um, the first species that has a one next to it. So um, I also did this with the Palmer penguins data set. So I used the dummy, the fast dummy. So this is, I guess, more tidy verse um, friendly. I, I just Googled it. So I don't really know anything about it, but it, it worked. I, I didn't, it didn't, the, the convert, the way that the book did dummy variables didn't work for the Palmer data set for me. I, I don't know if I just was making a mistake there, but so we have three types of three species of penguins and the data set has data on the, like the bill length, the flipper length, the weight of the penguins, the island. Um, I'm not sure exactly what we do with it from a multi-level, what, what our response variable, what we'd be predicting, but um, so that's the data set. So here, <clears throat> so here's the, some more dummy variables where, uh, so it's fast dummies, dummy calls, penguins. And so again, you know, our, so we've got the chin strap again to the Adelie here. So we see the Adelie here. And so anytime um, you have the presence of that particular uh, factor, there's a one, and if it's not, it's a zero. And so, uh, and of course you'll notice that, so this, 
this is adding columns to your data set, right? So it's potentially, if you have a lot of data, there's potential that you're, you're really adding a lot to it. Um, all right, so, so there's a couple things here. So we'll go through sort of the linear regression with the, where each course has its own coefficient. And then we'll kind of head back and talk about uh, uh, multi-level modeling on a conceptual level again. And then we'll go to the kind of multi-level model, the L -E -L -M -E -R model. Um, so anyway, so important to add, so here's the data. So this is one of the, um, one of the, yeah, the kind of data.edu. This is uh, one of the walkthroughs that doesn't spend a lot of time on the kind of data wrangling aspect of it. I mean, if you go to walkthrough one, it, it does the data wrangling on this data set, but if you're wanting to pull up um, data, you know, now or in the future, and this is of course in the book to kind of work through it yourself, you can just sort of pull it up through, through this uh, command. Um, I included a chart from the walkthrough one here. Uh, so we see this is just time spent in final grade. And so you kind of see this is where the intercept is. And then you see there, you know, uh, as, as the time spent in the course is increasing, you're seeing uh, the final grade increase there. So, so here's the code for the first kind of just basic linear regression. And so, you know, kind of familiar. So LM, familiar, we have the dependent variable and then the tilde, and then you list the independent variables. Uh, so we have the time again, and then we have the course ID. And the table that's created here is actually like 26 courses. I only have a few here that you can see. And so we notice the, the intercept at 73.2. And so that's like a 73, you know, 73.2% uh, uh, chance or, or like 73% like out of 100 um, on the course. So, and then, so part of the, how the, part of how this works is a reference level is used. So the intercept in this case is actually one of the courses. I think it's a physiology course. And so this would indicate 73.2% um, association of, of people in the physiology course their, to their final grade. If you're, if you're in your physiology course, kind of what the final grade might be. Um, and then we see time spent has this 9.66 impact. And then, so all the courses, which we kind of saw on the graph recently. And so all the courses here are in reference to the reference class or in reference to here. So we, for this one, you know, we'd say 73.2 minus 1.59. So people are potentially doing a little bit worse in this course. Here, this course 7.24, you know, so that's around 80%. And then, you know, negative 3.56. So the sort of kind of returning to the multi-level, just kind of the theory behind it. And the book kind of really goes over just the fact that some of the underlying statistics and concepts can be hard to grasp, but some of the actual application can be pretty straightforward. Um, a couple nuances is, you know, with um, doing a multi-level model is sort of, you know, ease of interpretation versus complexity. You know, if you have a lot of, a lot of dummy variables, that can be, can be good because you have more, more data in your model, but it might be harder to make sense of. Um, 
And adding a section group to the model helps us meet the assumption of independent data points by considering the effect of being in a particular section. So again, another quote from the book that kind of talks about the independent, the, the goal of, of, of independence of um, the variables. And so in the book, it says, if, you, if you're gonna, if you are gonna dig into this deeper, you might wanna know a couple sort of terminology. One was regularization. It said, instead of determining how different the observations in a group are from those in the reference group, the multi-level model regularizes the difference based on how systematically different the groups are. So, <clears throat> so I'm a little bit fuzzy on this, but you know, there, there, he's kind of starting to explain the difference between what we just saw with the linear regression and what we're about to see with <clears throat> this um, intra-class correlational coefficient, ICC, which explains the proportion of variation in the dependent variable that the groups explain. And so a smaller ICC means groups are not important. A larger ICC about 0.10 or 10% or larger um, indicates groups are important. So we'll see that here in, so again, here we've got LMER. So it's, you know, instead of LM, it's uh, just a little bit different syntax here. Otherwise we, we see, it looks pretty familiar. We see final grade as a dependent variable. Um, and then independent variable time spent again. Uh, this looks a little bit different uh, because so we've got course ID and then, then there's this uh, the pipe and then the number one um, there. So, but basically that's how it would look for any, uh, any group grouping variable you'd be putting in here. You just put it in like that. And then the tab model is, kind of outputting the summary statistics. We do see the ICC here. Uh, so we see some information we've seen before, kind of the overall effects. And we see the ICC here as 0 0.09. And then there's another kind of function where we can see the adjusted ICC which again is 0 0.09, which um, I'm trying to see if I have that. So yeah, the book says that nine uh, that point zero nine means nine point one percent of the variability in the percentage of points students earned can be explained simply by knowing what class they are in. So. Um, <laughs> any questions about that? Any comments? It's a, it's a little bit fuzzy to me. I haven't, you know, actually worked with this um, in a real situation. Anyone want to kind of uh, chime in with some additional comments here? Specifically about the LMER. I'm actually also curious, just kind of like, well, so what, so what, what do we do with this? So we, we're, it seems like we're adjusting for things, right? We're like, we don't, we want to make sure we're not off on our predictions or our correlations or whatever, because there's these different effects classes that, that are skewing things and we want to adjust for those things. So, so that, that seems clear to me. And, and that kind of speaks to the um, independence of observations and making sure your assumptions are clear. Um, and then so I'll ultimately making sure your, your, your model, your data, your conclusions are, are, are more accurate. Um, and, you know, I, I think it could be helpful to, you know, my, my initial thought on it was something you know, around the effect of, well, you know, maybe one particular course is, is harder than another. And so you kind of want to like factor that in if you're looking at, a faculty review or student performance and, and different things like that. You don't want to treat everything equal if they're not equal. And I could see how you would want to, you know, look at just running this, this code could be helpful to get kind of this 
nine percent and and say well how what what other group effects you just kind of know more about that um other than that i'm not sure quite where to go with that anyone what what else how could you do with this Yeah, I think my, I'm just trying to recall, um, you know, now that we know that, you know, a similar question to yours and even just even prior to that, like how do we interpret even the intercept and the time spent thing? Is that, is that interpreted the same way that we interpret um, those variables in linear regression? Um, because I know like in, in, multi-level models, we can vary on the intercept and we can vary on the slope. Um, and so I, I was just assuming that all, you know, table 13.4 um, in the book, uh, yes, that one, <clears throat> um, it shows that, you know, the intercept 75.63, what, you know, what is that? Is that, the, is that the reference group or is that the mean percentage of all the um, kind of the average class or um, you know what what's that and then the 9.45 is that like assumed that slopes are non-varying across the classes um, so regardless of class if you for every one unit of time spent studying or whatever um, there's an expected value of increase of 9.45 um, so that's, I know that there's a, just a lot of different things that you can vary with uh, mixed effects models. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure I was understanding this particular one, uh, even on, uh, just on those two estimate, uh, estimated values there before we even got into the different courses, right? <clears throat> so that's my, yeah, that's my question to anyone who can help us out here. <laughs> I think the, the random effects, like so this one, one over course ID means that you're only varying on intercepts, right? Because like random slopes would have a different, it would be like one plus something, like another variable over course ID. So I think like by the structure of this, we're only allowing the intercepts for each course to vary. Um, so yeah, the slope would be the same, but then if you add the random slope, you're allowing both to vary, I think. I don't know exactly when you would want to do that, um, but I have seen like visualizations where the intercepts for each of the classes are kind of visualized different. Like, um, like you can see kind of the separations of like that 75 wouldn't be the same for each course ID, but I'm not exactly sure how to get that from the model output. Um, that doesn't really answer your question, sorry. But yeah, I, I definitely have heard of like the different differing slopes versus the intercepts. Um, and I don't I only think we're doing intercepts here based on what I remember. Yeah, I mean that seems right to me. And that, that's what I was kind of trying to think through because we did have different slopes for each course in the linear regression. I was reading an article, it was from a psychological, from a psychologist and there, there, there was some sort of statistical approach to kind of see whether you got value out of varying the slopes and intercept or just the intercept. And so whether you, know, you just include it or not based on that. And, you know, I might not be able to remember this example great, but it's like there's the example of like three people 
and it was some sort of psychology test where you know you'd see like a, a shape and a color or you you, you know you'd be asked to respond to or you know, something would be would say green but the color would be orange or something like that and you know there's some sort of response time and the yeah okay yeah I figured you'd know about it um and so at least as, as it was explained in this thing, article I was reading they wind up just varying the intercepts and so then that implied that that these three individuals, and this of course is a hypothetical example because you wouldn't just have three people, but the three individuals then, you know, with the intercept that that reflects that their language, they might or or, or foreign language or whatever it was, they would might be starting at a different point. Um, but then this, you know, the slope where they're going from that point is is the same. And then of course, if you're varying both, then they'd be starting from different points, but then the slopes would would um, be, be different as well. And so I don't know how that applies here if, if it's, but yeah, but we, we do have with this one, we're, we're looking at um, just the, the intercepts being different. So each, um, I wasn't able to figure out how to, how to graph this, but so each um, course would then Right, would have be like would start at a different point, right? But then the the slope would be the same. So I don't know what to do with that either, but that occurred to me. So yeah, I just I just plotted all the different courses. Um, uh, and I would say, like, I don't know, a, a majority of them are all going in, in the same direction when you do time spent studying over, uh, with final grades. Um, most of them are have a pretty strong positive relationship. There's a few of them that are go down, um, at least according to just using, like, GM Smooth with an LM method um, but that's yeah that's how I would I listen to your point like that's how I visualized them before was like just doing a group you know grouping by the course ID or color by the course ID um, just to see where and then do a, a smooth geo, geom smooth thing just to see what the heck's going on um, but yeah it looks like they all kind of start somewhere a little bit different and there's there's definitely some variance in the different slopes but I think that's tested in, with like other model metrics like AIC and BIC and stuff like that, among other things, right? So what do you say it's tested by it? Like that, that what is that testing determining? Um, just like, um, so like in, like in a linear model, you can get the AIC, or BIC, which is a um, a measure of um, statistical bias, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, so and you want a smaller AIC <clears throat> or a smaller BIC or a smaller mean squared error, you know, other things like that. Um, and I think I think mix of X models have can have an AIC calculated, and they may have other fit metrics model fit metrics to determine um you know the line that you draw how good is it right compared to the points um <clears throat> and so then you can just compare different you know varying slopes or varying intercepts or compare it to a normal linear model and then you can uh, you know if your models are uh, nested you can do some different things but if they're not nested you can still compare aic i believe um, and still the smaller aic is preferred. So that's a way of comparing models and potentially then comparing models that take various groupings into effect or not. Right.
All right, so I'm gonna go over my, uh, well, so um, for further study, I've got a couple things here. Uh, and, and I guess this applies to me initially. I thought I would, uh, I didn't have time to go over a lot of these as much as I wanted to, but um, there's one, one talk at our studio global that stood out to me, Categorical, Categorical Embeddings, New Ways to Simplify Complex Data by Alan Fetter. It's a three minute uh, talk, uh, you know, obviously available online and there's an embed package. I think he was mostly working in kind of like deep learning kind of environments, but like the idea there is, is potentially like an alternative to dummy variables and kind of getting at why dummy variable, the, just the, uh, you know, Monte Cobb, like he said, like if you're to convert zip codes, to dummy variables, you know, that's like tens of thousands of columns that you're adding to your data set. But with the embed, it's like you have one, um, like one column. Um, so it, it kind of helps with that issue. Uh, feature engineering and selection, a practical approach for predictive models. Uh, again, there's like a, a chapter or a section on dummy uh, variables there. So you can kind of get, uh, get more into it if you, if you want to on, on um, the different different kinds there. Um, the, there's a regression and other stories book. Uh, there's this podcast here with the three authors, which, uh, and this one thing I wanted to get into more and didn't was uh, like in the podcast, they talk a lot about things like um, assumptions of causality and how Oftentimes people say correlation is not causation, but then when you're talking about linear regression, you sort of use causal language in saying that, you know, the independent variable Im you know, impacts the dependent variable. And so they kind of talk a bit about that um, in sort of other language to talk about, um, to talk about, um, make sure you're, you're uh, you know, that's like, instead of saying, you're controlling for variables you want to say you're adjusting for them because you, you only like control in like a lab setting and, and things like that um, and then tidy modeling with R um, that one um, chapter six is on feature engineering there's a section on dummy variables in there uh, you know and so the dummy variables is kind of in in, in that whole process. And there's like a step underscore dummy parentheses. And then in the parentheses, you put which, which variables you want to be made into dummies. And so that's kind of embedded in that whole process. Um, and regression and other stories is kind of a, um, an updated version of the 2006 book that's in the data science and education resources. And in the podcast, they mentioned they're also working on a, a second book uh, that's will be coming out at some point in the future that, that focuses on multi-level modeling. Um, so they kind of broke up the, both of those topics into two two books. But, um, and then, yeah, I, I used um, this presentation from Garrick and, and Brew on uh, Sherrigan. And so those are some things to study. Any, anyone else have any resources that, they, that they'd like to throw out there? I was just curious because I haven't used tidy models. Like, can you, does it have multi level modeling in it, like in the package? I don't know if anyone else can, can answer that. I, I, I didn't look too much into that. I did sort of do some Googling and it looked like they, they did have their own packages and syntax around that. Um, so, yeah, but I hadn't come across it. I didn't, you know, I, I've read most of that book and, 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 um, and I didn't come across it in there, but I did find when I Googled it, I found there are some videos and, and some content on it. So I do believe that there are, they do have their own packages. Awesome. Um, I just haven't looked into that much. I think, so, and that's why, um, partly because of time, partly I figure like a lot of the differences would just be 
syntax differences, you know, so if you were, if you already are a tidy models user and you were looking at the book and are like, well, I don't want to use this function, there's just probably different syntax for tidy models that you could incorporate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Um, you know, we can go back to, to general comments. If other people, other people have things to say. I, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you were, when you were, this is just a silly question. You were um, like, uh, when you were talking about L-M-E-R, um, mm -hmm. you would, that's how you would pronounce it, right? I'm just curious if other people have heard other pronunciations, because I always call it, I always call it lemur, um, um, which is fun, you know, but <laughs> L LMER is probably more professional. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't super familiar with, with LMER or lemur, so I was just like, what are those? what are the letters again? I don't, <laughs> so I, I had no idea, but I don't know what, yeah, in, in the modeling community, I don't know what they say, no idea. Lemur, I guess, will work. <laughs> All right, anything else? We did, we did have that, I mean, it was a few weeks ago where um, it kind of the question came up about the independence of the data points in like a situation where, well, if your independent variables have your like mid term grade, and then you're using in that, um, you know, that's not independent, that's then not gonna be independent of the final grade. And so, and then we kind of said, I think we said, well, independence of, of the observations is, is um, why, and I was coming, I came across like the, just like the regression fallacy that I thought might've been related to that. But does any, anyone have any other thoughts about that or sees that as related? Or just, connecting it to our previous conversation. If no one has any comments. No, I, I raised this to the group, but we haven't had a chance to discuss it yet. Um. Okay, so there is a multi-level multi mod. To me, it seems like they're working on it. I don't think they're quite there yet. Um, I think the tag at the top says experimental. So it might be, again, they might just be working on adding that. Yeah, it looks like it's not published to CRAN. That's cool though, good find. It does say though, it was published on CRAN right there though, which is confusing to me if you scroll down a little. Oh, I see. Yeah, right yeah. Top, if you yeah. scroll up a little, right, <clears throat> right there, it says it is on CRAN, which I don't find I find can a little confusing. Oh, never mind. It says not yet. Then never mind. I guess you just have it as a placeholder. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> Any uh, concluding comments from the leaders? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks for attending. <laughs> All right, I guess. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Appreciate thank you. it. 
All right, have a have a good week. Yep. See you. Bye. Bye.